Hi everyone, thanks for the intro, Ian. Uh, as Ian said, I'm Matthew Duig. I'm one of the co-founders of FX Digital. Um, my job at FX is as managing director. So what does that involve? That essentially involves overseeing the leadership team, setting the strategy for the business, but I also get quite heavily involved with our customers as well, supporting them with their strategies around OTT delivery and launch. And in particular, my knowledge spans connected TV. Um, so today I'm here to talk to you about how essentially we approach connected TV development I think when I spoke to Victoria, Victoria there was the, the mention of potentially like a demo and I thought, well, a demo probably isn't quite right for a company like us that uh, are like a bespoke agency that uh, provide technology services. We don't, we don't do things turnkey and release the same app every time. We, we approach things custom every time. So I thought I'd, I'd show everyone how we do that, what our approach is, and, and, and that might help. So who are we? We're based uh, over in London and this year also opened an office in Barcelona. Um, we're a team of about 60 people uh, and it's kind of a mix of, of skill sets and specialities. We've got product people, designers, of course, a, a large engineering team, a quality assurance team, because you as you can imagine, testing these, these devices and, and these applications on devices is one of the most important things that we do. And then uh, more recently in the last two or three years, we also have a quality engineering team that oversee the automation technology, which I'll talk a little bit about later today. Uh, we basically build high performance, scalable applications. And as I mentioned earlier, a, a strong focus on connected TV and some of these real nitty gritty kind of set top box devices as well. Cool. So here's a selection of some of the clients we've worked with. Um, we've done all sorts, really. Um, lots and lots of stuff with Discovery when we, when we first kind of moved into the the connected TV and OTT world. Uh, we were heavily involved in the D-Play project, the Eurosport project, the Discovery Plus project, lots of stuff across the major uh, TV devices and also set-top boxes. Um, worked with ATP Media, so we're the team that built the tennis TV application. Um, I think that's live on a lot of the major connected TV applications as well as obviously web and mobile, but we built the Samsung, LG, Amazon Fire, Android TV uh, applications. BritBox is another great client of ours, so we work with the BritBox international team, and that engagement is really about launching onto set-top boxes. Um, so again, a lot of our knowledge is around building for devices like Comcast and Rogers and Cox and all those wonderful devices. Um, and then many other clients, as you'd expect from any company, we, we work with lots of, lots of different clients. Cool, so today I want to talk to you about one of our customers, uh, and that's Dyne. So for those of you that don't know Dyne, they're a uh, sports-based broadcaster in the DAC region. And the concept of Dyne was, was quite simple, but, but great, in that they understand that you know, there's a lot of uh, following for one major sport in Europe and across the world, which is football, but they wanted to create a home for those people that were looking to consume sports outside of football. So the alternative sports, things like handball, volleyball, table tennis, and really, that's what their, their vision was. And they approached us very, very early on in the, in the project process at the very beginning to essentially support them in the creation of um, a suite of applications, OTT applications, so that they could stream this to their audience. Um, they worked with Delta Trade to provide the, the back end infrastructure. And Delta Trade also built the web and the mobile applications. And then they commissioned us to build the connected TV applications in particular. Uh, so yeah, real, real like multi-vendor approach. And then interestingly, actually Dyn themselves built their own, um, what they call the, the customer care. So their own identity management and kind of auth service basically. So as you can imagine for us, that introduced some interesting complexity, integrating with an auth service that's bespoke and custom, whilst also integrating with a lot of, a lot of Delta Trades back office stuff. So why did they choose us? So I've mentioned we have a lot of strength with building connected TV applications. Lots of experience with operator set-top boxes, but also being that we're bespoke developers, we have deep understanding of, of APIs, like our approach allows us to consume documentation, read it, and then spec and build for integrations. Um, but we're, we're also quite proud of our, our agency kind of categorization, and, and we, we do deliver and emphasize really great customer service, um, and especially that's important when we're looking at a project like this that is, that is a bespoke build. We have lots of experience with live video playback, um, which is super important when you're working with connected TV. It can be really easy to just assume that video playback should just work on connected TV, but it doesn't. So that's another uh, a great, great thing about the team. As I mentioned on the previous slides, we have lots of experience with sports clients as well. I think I mentioned Eurosport, but GCN and, and other clients as well. And then we, we have agile teams that can deliver scalable applications in, in quick time. 
So in a, in a nutshell, Andreas, the CEO of Dyne, provided this lovely quote for us. Um, and he kind of emphasized our ability to innovate and also provide high quality in these applications too. So cheers, Andreas. Cool, so what were the launch platforms for Dyne? So it's quite, quite a mission for us. We had to launch in time for a, a handball season, I think it was. So there's an immovable deadline. Um, and Dyne themselves had some commercial, commercial agreements with certain device um, vendors, which meant that we had to get out in time for that, that handball season. And the launch devices were Sky, Magenta, Android TV, and Tizen, with Am Amazon Fire to, to follow quickly after that. And just looking at those devices, you've got a real mix of different technologies that run on these devices. So Android TV and Amazon Fire are both Android-based devices. But then you've got Sky and, uh, sorry, Magenta as well as an Android-based device. But then you've got Sky and Tizen, which take web applications. Tizen is obviously a bit more, um, a bit more of a major platform than, than Sky, which is an operator box. Um, and they allow you to launch things onto their stores, like a vendor self-service process. And Sky is a more relationship-based application submission process where you, where you hand them a URL. So the notable features of the application, like what were we looking to build here? I think I mentioned earlier on Dyn's customer kind of control center. So there was an important piece, which was for us to integrate with their identity management service that they built um, and obviously provide QR code authentication on the, on the devices themselves. Uh, a sports switcher. So interestingly about this application, what they wanted a fan to be able to do was to come on and choose their preferred sport, whether that be handball, volleyball, table tennis, and then for it to therefore personalize their entire journey throughout the application once they've made that choice. And at any one time, a user can then dart into a, 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 a sports switcher and then change their sport if they want. So something that's quite unique about a, a TV application, again, that's something that we're familiar with specking and building out is these custom kind of unique features. Live video, video playback I mentioned, and I'll come on to in a minute, um, one of the partners that, that, that drove that forward. Um, and then editorial, editorially controlled layouts obviously being quite important too. So really, what was the mission? Um, a new technology infrastructure, five launch devices, two of them being operator set-top boxes, which are you know, typically the tricky, tricky ones, and then a movable deadline. So you know, lo lots of pressure. Um, but with that much to do, it's really important for us as a company to be efficient in the way that we approach this. And now I'm just gonna go on to some of the ways that we were able to optimize our process and make it more efficient. So the project setup, uh, like most companies, any project we do starts with a bit of a workshop and a kickoff discovery phase. That's where we get into the nitty gritty, mostly about user stories. We use tools like user story mapping to really flesh out what the, what the application needs. Um, technical planning in this project was um, incredibly important because we were building something without anything that existed previously. It was very important to use things like sequence diagrams, infrastructure diagrams to really highlight, outline what we were all building before we then went in and did it. So we had some really, really great sessions with the partners Delta Tray and also Dyne where we, where we, we diagrammed all this stuff out. It's important for us to align on objectives, sounds silly, but at the very, very early on point in the process, it's important to us all agree what we're building and why we're building it. Um, and then the project team was assembled. So I don't know if you can see that behind me, but the project team that was assembled to build Dyne consisted of a project manager, a product manager, three front end engineers and three QA testers. And then that team had support from our internal quality engineering team, which set up the automation tooling and, and, and uh, testing that we use. So that, that's kind of around an average team size for a project of, of this for us. Um, and I'll come on to it later, but it took around seven or eight months to build everything that, that I'm talking about today. So one of the great things that we did and often do as a team is we make important decisions early on. So one of the first and, and most important decisions we make in any CTV project is to proof of concept the video player at one of the earliest stages in the project. When we're first commissioned, one of the first questions we're asking is, where are the video streams? Can we get the DRM tokens? We need everything to start building out a video player because we need to make sure that that video player can play their video assets on all the target devices. So the first thing we really do in any project is to build a video player, which sounds silly because you're like, well, let's build the app first. But no, we start with a video player. The great thing about this project is that because we were working with Delta Trade, we leveraged their Diva video player. So that made it a lot more efficient for us to, to obviously launch on, on these devices. If we had to build our own video player, maybe using one of the open source candidates like HLSJS or Shaka, that would have added a bit of a, a, bit of a timeline to the project. We used a web-based CTV architecture. Um, and it, interestingly, we use this across Android and Amazon too. And I'll come on to an innovation that we introduced that allowed us to leverage native features in that environment whilst also building using a web-based architecture. And the web-based framework that we chose was Lightning JS. 
And the great thing about Lightning, and again, I'll come on to this in a, in a bit, is that it renders thing, things in a technology known as WebGL, which gives us greater consistency across devices. And then one of the other decisions we make as a CTV business is when it comes to submitting applications to the App Store, we don't wait until the application's ready. We wait until about a month into the project. We might have a skeleton app that has one page of video play out, and we submit it then. The reason we do that is just to warm up the stores, because if you wait until the very last, last days to submit your application, you're not going to get a response from Samsung for 10 weeks, and you're going to wish you'd submitted it earlier. So we submit applications knowing they're not ready just to prepare the vendors, and then we ensure that they can't launch them by not tick ticking that box. And that just starts the dialogue really early on in the process, which is, which is super important. So now I'll talk about those efficiencies and innovations that I mentioned earlier. The first one being how our design team approached design files. So this is a, a GIF showing um, a collection of Figma files that are all linked. So our design team essentially have a global brand file, a components file, and then the high fidelity mockups of all of the, the different pages of the application. What that allows them to do is to basically, if they change the logo or a brand color in the brand file, it rolls out to all of those other files straight away. Similarly, if they change a component in the component file, I think which is what this is essentially showing, they're changing brand colors here and they go on to, to change the sports switcher component. That then rolls that out across, across all the files as well. So you can see how we can really quickly iterate and make changes to design files without having to go through loads of chaos and carnage to do so. Lightning, so I mentioned Lightning earlier on, and what we've got here is, um, I actually used GIFs for this, which I thought you know, I was quite proud of. Um, but here we've got Sky and Magenta renderings. Um, and these are both rendering in Lightning on these set-top boxes. These are actually screen captures from the set-top box devices themselves. And uh, I was gonna put Samsung up as well, but didn't have the space and thought it looked better like this. But essentially on the right, you can see how Magenta renders that Lightning application. This is running within an Android container on that Magenta box. And on the left, you can see how the, um, the Sky device is rendering the same application. One of the only changes we've made here is to turn off animation on that Sky device because it's got a, li a little bit um, lower power than that Magenta device. But essentially, when we, when we built the application and then got it up on the next device, there is no, no, there is no change we have to make to the, to the interface to fix it or no CSS wizardry we have to do to make sure a box appears in the right place. The UI always looks the same across any device that we get it up on. And then our job is mostly around performance optimization and then, of course, video player testing and optimization. So the use of Lightning allowed us to build once, deploy everywhere. That allows web application really efficiently and effectively. This is probably one of the most interesting innovations that we introduced to the Dyn project, which I was particularly proud of. So very early on in the process, when we were doing the POC for the video player, we quickly learned that it would be much better for us to be able to use uh, the Diva Android SDK than, say, the web SDK on those Android-based devices. Not only could we leverage the native functionality of the Android player, but we could also then get much better performance out of that video player. So what we essentially did is we created an architecture in Android whereby we have a web view that's loaded within the, within the Android container, and then we created a commuter JavaScript library that passes JavaScript from the uh, web interface through to Kotlin and then invokes native functions in Kotlin. So it allows us to essentially, and again, what, what this video is showing here, when we hit the live button in the lightning build, it passes off and hands off onto Kotlin, and that is now native. So it allows us to leverage both web-based web uh, architecture and native-based architecture. So we haven't had to build the entire interface again in Android because it's all still in web. And then when we hand off to, to the native player, it's handed nicely off to Diva for Diva to then manage the player. So that allowed us to really efficiently deploy onto more, more Android devices and obviously saved us loads of pain in, in building out a video player. And then probably, probably last, not least, most importantly, is our approach to testing. So as a company, we obviously have a manual QA team, which are responsible for testing on device in our office. And that's been a, a huge um, secret to our success over the years. But more recently, we've now started automation testing. So this video here is a video of our lab in London. Um, and what, it, what you're seeing here is I actually asked one of the QE team members just to kick off uh, a, a test case run of the search test. So this is automatically testing the search results input and page. Um, there's no remote being used here. This is all being done over APIs and the TVs. And as it's doing this, it's taking screenshots at every step. What that essentially does is that every morning when a QA gets in, so obviously here we're just running the search results test, but 
what we really do every night is we run a complete regression test on every device that Dyn have. And then every morning when a QA comes in, it's automatically pushed into Slack, the results of those tests. So on this, this uh, Slack uh, image here, what you can see is you can see a list of the tests that began passing that were previously failing and the tests that began failing that were previously passing. So that allows our manual QA team to then at a glance go, right, what's happening here? How, how's, how's the test run run the day before? And what do I need to do? They'll take the failed tests. Um, the, this clicks through to our uh, test tool called Case, which is really effective. They take those failed tests. They go through to Case. They see the evidence. So the technology posts the screenshots into an evidence folder on Case, um, along with logs, actually. So it's got device logs, so they can see if there's any console errors or whatnot. And then they validate those, validate those failures. If the failures are due to flaky tests or the app might have updated in a way that the test case wasn't written for, they manage that themselves. But if the fail failures are genuine, they then jump on the stand up that morning and they report those values back to the team. So you can see how having this automation set up rolled into our process allows us to be really efficient in, in the build. The best thing about this is that for the development team, as they're building um, things out, they can work in the knowledge that the main branch is being tested every single night. And if there's going to be an issue that they've introduced, they'll catch it on that, on that evening, which is really great because it means that they know exactly the code that they've written the day before. They introduce that bug and they can fix it there and then. Obviously, the issue with running regressions every four weeks is that if you go to an engineer and go, oh, this, this bug's in the code that I found, they go, oh, I worked on that three weeks ago. Like, I, don't know, I don't know what that was. Um, but this has allowed us to be really, really super efficient. Cool. So run out of time, but just to finish on this, um, we made it for the handball season. Uh, and to celebrate, we had a, had a launch party in the office. Um, these were all 0% beers. <laughs> uh, but this is us in the office, um, basically watching the handball game having good fun about it. Um, and then following that, that successful launch, we've then introduced a further sport into the platform for Dyn, uh, which is hockey, um, which again, has been really great. And then we've followed on with more launches onto more platforms. So we've launched that same architecture that I mentioned there, as I discussed on Fire TV, but then on LG Web OS, on Well OS as well, and then Apple TV being Swift, we've actually built that in, in native Swift because you can't run web applications on Apple TV. So that's me. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Hopefully, that gives you a bit of an insight into the way we do things and how we optimize for connected TV development. If you've got any questions, let me know. Thanks.